she doesn't appear as a goddess, she appears as a human being, as an old lady. She comes to a place where she takes a job as a nanny and she takes care of a young prince and she tries to make him immortal by holding him over a fire each night. And eventually the queen discovers her and gets really upset because the nanny is frying the baby. And she snatches the baby back, and then Demeter transforms herself back into a goddess. She grows, so her head almost breaks the ceiling. And then Demeter tells her, you stupid woman, I was going to make your son immortal, but that's not going to happen now. Hi there, hello, you're listening to Hey Lesson, the podcast where we ask smart people silly questions about video games. Uh, every episode we get an expert of some real life topic, uh, that might be a scientist, a historian, whatever. Uh, and we use a recent game as an excuse to extract all of that person's knowledge. Uh, but we also have some chat about the game itself as well. Today, that game is Hades, uh, a roguelike action game set in the Greek underworld where the player must escape by fighting the shades and ancient Greek heroes who stand in his way. Soon we're going to hear from an archaeologist who's going to tell us all about hero cults uh, and all about how the gods were really seen by the people of ancient Greece, and also if there really was any escape from the realm of the dead. Uh, as usual, I do have a guest co-host with me to help out uh, with the game side of things, and this time that is uh, Chris Bratt of People Make Games. Hiya! Hello, Brendan. I'm so glad you have uh, an ancient history expert to refer to, because my knowledge of Greek gods isn't isn't great, but I do know quite a bit about the video game Hades, so hopefully I can... I'll, I can rely on that bit. <laughs> I think useful. there's some crossover. There is. I think there's there some is. crossover. I need to get into the habit of asking asking people, my guest co-hosts, who they are, because I realise some of my listeners might not know. What, what's your deal, Chris? I am part of a team called People Make Games. We're a YouTube channel that makes videos, kind of like short documentaries, if you want to be very generous, uh, about video games, how they're made, the culture surrounding them. And for, I guess a relevant example here is we recently did one about Hades, but specifically the way that game's dialogue system works, because I think it's really interesting and it's a huge part of why this game's story uh, hits right. And yeah, so we, we like really delve into kind of a niche topic like that. Last night, as we're recording, mm -hmm. last night the Game Awards were on. Just before we go into any video, any Hades chat, I want to ask you, because you told me before we started recording uh, that you stayed up to watch the Game Awards. Yeah. What, why? It's like three o'clock in the morning as well. I'm really not sure. That I wasn't intending to do that. I just, I don't know. It's very, very, very commercial. Even as award shows go, it's like some of the awards themselves and the winners were sort of raced through at breakneck speed so that they could get to the next trailer or whatever it was. Um, I can't tell you why I did it, but I'm kind of glad that I did, mostly because... Do you remember the video game Ark, Brendan? Uh, the survival, it's a survival video mm -hmm. game, isn't it? Where you fight dinosaurs and then you they poo. That is exactly right. Um, and turns out they announced a sequel last night and it's starring Vin Diesel and the trailer is the weirdest thing you've ever seen. At one point he looks down at his arm, which is glowing, with the, the logo of the video game arc. And it's just, it's so strange. Uh, but yes, Game Awards, it was strange. And maybe I should have gone to sleep instead. Did, did Hades, the game that we're going to be talking about, did it win any awards? It was robbed, is what it was, Brendan. It won one award, which was Best Action Game. Although that was annoyingly one of the awards that they just raced through. So there wasn't even an acceptance speech, uh, which kind of sucked. And it was up for... A whole bunch, including Game of the Year, which went to The Last of Us 2, which I think felt a little... It felt unfair to Hades, which has been a very special game this year. Cool. Well, let's let's use the this podcast, this episode then, to, yeah. to sell Hades a little bit. From what I can tell, you have played a whole bunch. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely have. Can you give the listener a rundown, like someone who hasn't even heard of it? What is Hades? What does the player do in it exactly? Sure. So uh, you mentioned before that it's, it's a roguelike action game. Um, uh, it might be worth coming back to the word roguelike in a second, uh, but generally you play as a character called Zagreus, who is the the son of the god Hades, and you're trying to get out of the underworld, like fight your way out of the underworld uh, for reasons that become a bit clearer as you play. And um, as you defeat enemies, uh, which are also beings that are trapped in the underworld with you, you're sort of granted uh, upgrades, or they're called boons in the game, uh, 
um, from the Olympian gods, so like Zeus, Poseidon, all the big names are there, and they give you extra powers because they're under the impression that you want to come and live with them on Mount Olympus, which may or may not be the exact truth, but we're not going to tell them because it's kind of useful to have the power of Zeus when you're fighting in the underworld, I suppose. And yeah, so it's a roguelike game, which means that whenever you uh, fail and die, your progress is, is wiped and you start from the beginning, um, and then your next run of the game can actually be pretty different. So you'll fight different varieties of enemies, get different upgrades from the gods, and the experience can actually be quite unique compared to previous runs, which is why people like roguelikes, this, this sort of loop of okay, I died, I messed it up, but like next time, next time everything's going to be uh, okay and we'll, we'll get the, the right list of upgrades to, to nail it. However, what separates Hades from other roguelikes is that the way in which it like incorporates that idea into the narrative as well. So if you die in a boss fight in Hades, the next time you see that character, they'll be like, I killed you, didn't I? You weren't very good last time we thought. And they'll, they'll actually reference what happened and not ignore the fact that you keep dying and starting over again, which some roguelikes have to do because it's kind of a difficult narrative thing to explain. Um, however, if you're in the underworld where everyone's already dead, it makes total sense that if you die, you just go back to a different part of the underworld. And so the game is able to work the mechanics of a roguelike into the narrative it's telling. It, that is actually just completely... We've never really seen that in this genre before. And I think people already really loved roguelikes because of that loop we were talking about earlier. But Hades, on top of that, actually says, like, every time you, you have another go, you're also going to experience a, an interesting and fully voiced storyline uh, that matters to you uh, on each run. And so there's just a whole bunch of reasons to keep trying over and over again. We're going to go deeper into the, the nether realm in a moment uh, and deeper into what you like about the game. Uh, but first, we always have a big question in each episode of Hey Lesson, and this time it is, can you ever leave Hades? Uh, having never died and gone to Hades, we're not really equipped to answer this question. But... <laughs> I was terrified that was me then. <laughs> but maybe an archaeologist of the ancient Greek world can help us out. So we spoke to Gunnel Ekrot of the University of Uppsala, uh, and she is going to tell us not only about Hades and the heroes who dwell there, uh, but also about the rituals and sacrifices we might do to please them. So here she is. Prince of the Underworld, Zagreus rises from a fitful slumber with much mischief on his mind. Gunnar Ekrot, can you please introduce yourself to our listeners? Uh, who are you and what do you do? Hey, my name is Gunnar Ekrot and I am a professor of classical archaeology and ancient history at the University of Uppsala uh, in Sweden. And my research mainly concerns ancient Greece and in particular various aspects of the religious practices and religious lives of the ancient Greeks. We're currently playing a video game called Hades, which is all about uh, an ancient Greek god trying to escape the underworld. But Hades, the place, uh, can you tell us what what is it described like, according to myth? Basically, it was a pretty dull place. There was no sun, of course. It was very grey and dark and, and fairly boring. And once you entered, you could never leave. You spent your time pretty much doing nothing. Then there was a particular section of Hades called the Tartaros, where those who had really behaved badly towards the gods were sent. These are the mythological figures like um, Sisyphos, who tricked death and then had, was punished by pushing a stone up a mountain and never succeeded. Then there was also something like a VIP section, the Elysian Fields, where um, heroes and some very fortunate and good people would end up. And that was more of a sunny and pleasant meadow or a beautiful island where you would spend more pleasant time in death. But for most people, most dead persons, that would be the regular Hades, which was gray and dull and dark and boring. Within the depths of Tartarus reside the most wretched of all the shades who linger for eternity within the underworld. Uh, so Hades in popular culture is sometimes shown as like a, f a fiery place. Is that 
fair or like what's the origin of that idea i think that seems to be influence of the uh, christian notion of hell no hades the greek hades what was not um, not hot at all it was more it was more like of a reflection of um, a regular landscape you could say you entered by passing over the river styx where you took the ferry run by a guy called Charon, and this is where you have to pay you have to have a coin in your mouth so you can pay the, the journey and then you come to the other side there is a three-headed dog kerberos that's very aggressive but won't bite you and then after that you enter into Hades and then you of course can't leave because the dog will prevent you from leaving and you won't have any money to pay for the ferry journey back so you were stuck once you enter. Charon mate, now hypothetically if I provided you with say a thousand coins would you be willing to give me a ride in your beautiful boat? Upriver I should say specifically. Hades is also a person or is, is also a god. The ruler of the underworld is called Hades as well. What did he look like according to evidence? Well, first of all, Hades is a god we don't know very much about. There is no indication that he would have looked anything different from his brothers, Poseidon and Zeus. And that is that he would have been exceptionally beautiful and tall, with very good hair, probably a beautiful beard. The notion of the Greeks was, was that the um, ancient gods were extremely beautiful. They were also shiny. Uh, they smelled very well. So there is no indication that Hades would not have been that, even if he was then uh, in the underworld. This is good because in the game there are plenty of jokes the players are making because all of the gods are drawn as really handsome and good looking and sexy. That's perfectly correct. I mean, and also sexy, of course, absolutely. A, a Greek god was some, some a person or had an appearance that was extremely attractive. Zagreus, you don't have any doors. Why are you always so surprised? In the game, uh, we play as... I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. Is it Zagreus or Zagreus? Zagreus. He's described as the son of the god Hades, but who is he in Greek mythology? And why is he one of the lesser known gods in popular culture? Well, he is uh, lesser known because we know very little of him. Concretely, we have very little ancient evidence. And he's a very obscure figure. According to one tradition, he is a variant, or this is an epithet, of the wine god Dionysus. And according to that myth, he is then the son either of Persephone, who is the, the, the goddess of the underworld, uh, Persephone and Zeus, or Persephone and Hades. But that's pretty much what we know about him. Uh, the actual name probably comes from a Greek word called sagre, which means um, hunting pit or a hunting net, some kind of hunting equipment. So it has to do something with hunting. And it's also been suggested that Sagres is a kind of a deity linked to um, the, a master of animals um, who controls animal life and in that sense might be connected to Hades. But the main problem with Sagres is that, that we have so few sources. Who is he, really? Lord Hades never would indulge such questions. Um, are there any other forgotten gods of the Greek pantheon? Who's your favourite god that nobody outside of your field seems to know about? <laughs> well, I worked a lot on hero cults. And there is one, I have one favourite hero who's called Egretes. And he's known from one single inscription. He has a group of Athenians who worship him. And they have a little precinct. And this inscription lays out how this group sublets his precincts for 10 years. And it specifies what the person leasing the precinct can do and not do with the various kinds of equipment. And it's this, it's this tiny window into regular Athenians, like a group that we could have belonged to if we had been ancient Athenians. Achilles in the spotlight. Tell us some more about these hero cults. Like, what are they exactly? It sounds like you're describing a sort of like a club or like a me like a members club or a gym or something. Absolutely. I mean, this, this, these types of cult associations, they don't only have to uh, devote themselves to a hero. They could also be for gods, but they are really like clubs. When I teach, I describe them like a chess club or almost a football team or something. You, you have a social grouping, and, but instead of playing chess or playing football or drinking simply, uh, you will be worshipping a divine figure. And depending on who you are and your resources you might have a temple or a little chapel or whatever uh, and probably when you would meet to worship this figure you would also have animal sacrifice and you would eat that would be very important the lounging area within the house of hades is a dismal place to be in spite of its intended purpose to enliven the house's grim inhabitants one of the characters in the game 
is Theseus, and he's uh, he's sort of an antagonistic person in the game. You have to fight him. Did Theseus have a hero cult in ancient Greece? Absolutely. He was very, very big in Athens. He was like their national hero, you could say, because in the mythic account, I mean, he's the son of, of, of the Athenian king, but he's born out of wedlock. And there is this whole story that he comes back to Athens to claim his kingdom and almost gets killed. And then in the mythological tradition, because Athens is the home of democracy in the 5th century BC, but in myth, he's described as, as arranging some kind of proto democracy and also organizing the whole political system of Athens and, and the integrations of young men into society and so on. What kind of things would uh, Theseus fans get up to? Well, they would, do, of course, they would worship him. Then you would have animal sacrifice and processions and dining and particular games. And when a hero is worshipped, he can also, he or she, and there are female heroes, even children, child heroes and baby heroes, they can come back and help the worshippers. And there are these sightings of a particular Theseus is said to have participated and fought the Persians in the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC, for example. And the best way to understand this, this is to think of Elvis. <laughs> He's a perfect hero cult. And this whole thing with the sightings of Elvis and Elvis has left the buildings, it makes perfect sense for a Greek hero cult. Now hold a moment, fiend. Asterius made me aware that you recently asked of him an autograph, a tribute to his fame. As I am champion, I am prepared to generously offer mine as well. You edited a book, uh, a collection called The Round Trip to Hades, which talks about Hades as, yes, this place of suffering or is associated with loss, but it's also a place to socialize. Why was Hades a good place to hang out? Well, the thing is that once you enter, you, you can check out any time, but you can never leave, so to speak. So eventually everybody will be there. So if you enter late, everybody's already there. So there are all these persons. You can meet Homer and Plato and Socrates and who not. Everybody's there. And this is something that the later, the Roman sources and even the early Christian sources, they make a big thing of this, the, the kind of conversations you can have because everybody's there. In the ancient Greek tradition is that the living are never supposed to visit Hades. You're only supposed to go there when you're dead. And you have a couple of characters who actually can go down and come back. What is interesting though with these ancient figures who do that, when they come up they are the same, but we also have this in the Christian tradition, but there is very strongly emphasized that as soon as you're dead your body starts decomposing. So in the Christian uh, stories about Hades, all the people who are there are also falling apart. It's like, oh, I can see your skull. Your flesh is almost gone. And they always <laughs> even throw body parts at, at each other. It's just amazing. <laughs> Father, everybody's dead. Give them a break. Let's let's pretend, right, we're, we're trapped in Hades. It's a, it's a dark, gloomy, boring, sad party that everyone's at. But we've heard of these heroes of Orpheus and Theseus getting out. So how, how do we get out? Well, getting out, I think in the ancient tradition, there isn't any getting out. But it's trying to arrange so you're better prepared, so you will have a better stay. There was a whole group of um, religious uh, initiators or traveling priests, or it's difficult to know exactly how to call them, who apparently traveled around Greek territory. And apparently you went through some kind of training or at least initiation and finally, you were buried with a small piece of gold or a little gold leaf, a thin gold leaf with an inscription telling you of how to behave once you enter Hades. And that also assuring that the goddess of the underworld Persephone will recognize you when you come. And that in that case, you will get a better deal once you're in Hades. So it's like a little note of introduction. Yes, these texts are fabulous. There are these instructions that once you enter, don't drink from the first source, go to the second one. And when they ask you this, you should reply that and so on. So you have really have had proper instructions. So you will behave correctly. You will miss all these kind of um, traps that you can fall into. And eventually then you will be recognized by Persephone and get a better deal. That's great. It's like a tourist's guide. Yes, it is. And some of them, the texts are really interesting because there are some beautiful lines. As a kid, I fell into the milk. As a lamb, I fell into the milk. As a young bull, I leapt into the milk. And this is in several of these gold leaves, and we don't know what it means, but it must have been very essential for those undergoing this initiation. Little tip, boyo. 
You find any coinage while you're out there, you'll be sure to pawn it off to that old Kiron. Boatman guy, use it or lose it, pal. Use it or lose it. There are other practices, ancient practices, um, that I think you're an expert in. The ancient Greeks had a process of appeasing the gods that involved sacrificing animals. Can you tell us exactly what a ritual animal sacrifice would involve to give us all the grisly details? Absolutely. This is my speciality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, first of all, uh, Animal sacrifice, you could say, is the major ritual in ancient Greece. This is your, what you would do if you had the resources. You would also give the gods fruit and cheese and flowers and whatnot if you didn't have the money to pay for animals. The whole notion is that by giving something to the gods, the gods will give something back to you, this kind of reciprocity that you give each other gifts. And the animal you sacrifice is usually a domesticated animal, cattle, sheep, goat, pigs. Uh, it should be a healthy animal. It should be beautiful. You would then bring the animal to the place of sacrifice. People would then stand around the altar. You would throw some um, grain on the animal and the worshippers. Uh, some hairs from the forehead of the animal would be cut off and thrown into the fire on the altar. And then you would sprinkle water onto the animal so it would shake and show that he was alive and well because you don't want to sacrifice something that is about to die by itself of old age. After that, the purpose of the sacrifice is defined through prayer because you have to tell the god what you want. And you might sacrifice because you want to get help or you want, to, you want fertility or the crops will grow well or you will succeed in war or a journey. Or you want to thank the gods for something they already done. What would you even know of honest work? At least the wretched dead yet honor me as lord. After that, the th throat of the animal was slit, uh, the blood collected in a big bowl, a little bit splashed on the altar, while the rest was whipped so to break coagulation, and then they would transform it into blood sausages and black soup and stuff like that that was eaten. Um, after the animal was killed, the uh, thigh bones and the tail section, that is the back part of the basin with the tail, would be put into the altar fire. And if you put these bones into an altar, in, into a fire, they react from the heat. The tail will rise and curve. I've done experiments of this myself and it's foolproof. It's really amazing. I can recommend this strongly. You don't have to be a Greek priest or priestess. Anyone can do it. And the thigh bones wrapped in fat would al will also, after like 10 minutes, burn with very high, bright flames. And these were signs of that the gods were actually paying attention. They were seeing that you were sacrificing. They were answering the phone, so to speak. This is not someone I recognize. So, in the name of Hades, um, hello, may I ask who's calling? After that, you took the edible uh, innards, which, is, uh, which are the lungs, the liver, the heart, the kidneys, and the spleen, and grilled them in the altar, altar fire. And these pieces were then eaten by the people standing closest to the fire. And this is sharing these splankna, as they are called in Greek, is a sign of that you belong to the inner circle of, of the sacrificing community. The rest of the meat would be taken aside and butchered and divided. The basic principle was to divide everything after weight in equal portions. Most participants would get equal portions and that has then been by scholars today been linked to democracy, that everybody can vote, everybody are equal, everybody get equal portions at sacrifice. And there is something to this connection, I think. Uh, you've, you've performed some of these rituals as pra like practical experiments to see for yourself how the Greeks did these things. Yes. Um, uh, but like, I, you didn't eat the food as well. No, I have not killed any animals to sacrifice myself because I think also doing that you have to, then you really have to know how to handle animals. It's not just for anybody to like starting killing animals without knowing what you're doing. And I, also in Sweden, I think it would be illegal. But yeah. <laughs> when I did these experiments, then I bought the, um, the thigh bones and the tail section I got from uh, people raising animals in, in Sweden. And I also have some American colleagues who've done a long series of experiments on this in, in Athens. And then they bought um, tails and thigh bones from butchers. And also we got various kinds of innards. We did some grilling experiments. But in, a, in, in modern Greece today, this is what you eat. There is a dish called kukuretsi with exactly these um, innards that are grilled on spits. So it's 
it's not something strange that you would eat those parts. Oh, okay. So it is just like a, a barbecue. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. It's like a barbecue. Yeah, absolutely. The ancient casks of wine hidden within the recesses of the House of Lord Hades. Few have tasted the intoxicating vintage they contain. Why have tales of Greek gods endured so that even today we're making video games about them? Because they're just amazing stories. I, I mean, Greek mythology. I remember when my kids were small. I, I, we lived in France, and we had when you went go to a restaurant, you have to wait for ages to get the food. I would tell them Greek myths. Of course, I had to censor them because they're so full of violence and, and sexual incest. And, and it's like, oh, this part I can't tell. And then uh, blah, blah, and so on. But, but these are just amazing, powerful stories. And if I, if I can offer some reading tips, this um, story about the Demeter looking for her abducted daughter, Demeter, she's the god of fertility. It's an amazing story. And the whole, when she's looking for the daughter, all these stories, she comes to a place where she she takes a job as a nanny and she takes care of a young prince. Then she, she doesn't appear as a goddess. She appears as a human being, as an old lady. And she takes care of this prince and she tries to make him immortal by holding him over a fire each night. I am the eldest of Olympus, Sagrius. And I expect for you to treat me suitably. And eventually uh, the queen discovers her and gets really upset because the nanny is frying the baby, frying the son. <laughs> and she snatches the baby back. And then Demeter transform herself, transforms herself back into a goddess. And the description is that she grows so her head almost breaks the ceiling. And she shines so the whole palace shines. And the, the queen gets really afraid that she's going to get killed. And then she, Demeter tells her, you stupid woman, I was going to make your son immortal, but that's not going to happen now. But You yeah. stupid lady, let me fry your son. Yeah, yeah, and he will become immortal. You don't see the bigger <laughs> picture. <laughs> but I'm, yeah. Kunal Ekrot, thank you very much for talking to us about all this. Thank you. Uh, we've, we've learned an awful lot. Thank you. Uh, thus did the prince discover inadvertently the well-kept truth about his lineage. Entirely by chance, this did occur. That was Gunnar Ekroth, archaeologist and specialist uh, in ancient Greece. Uh, if you want to hear the full 45-minute interview we did with her, and you really do, then you can subscribe to the podcast on Patreon. It's $2 a month. You will get unabridged interviews with all of the experts we speak to, not just uh, our archaeologist from this episode. Uh, if you go to patreon.com slash heylesson or follow the links in the show notes below, uh, you'll find out how to get that. Uh, this is definitely one of the more interesting interviews. It it physically hurt me to cut out some of the stuff <laughs> that, that Gunnar was telling me about these ludicrous gods. Brat, have you ever roasted the thigh bone of a goat in praise of Zagreus? I have not. And I'm, I, when I was listening to that part of the uh, um, the interview, I was like, oh my God, are we going to... Is, has she done a crime? Is this illegal? Are we are we going to get in trouble for endorsing this? And then, thankfully, she she gave some important context afterwards. No, I have I've not. I'm I'm now a vegetarian, so I I, I don't know where I fit in the whole animal sacrifice ritual world. Uh, but it sounds interesting. Yeah, I had to um I, like I cut out a bunch of stuff because I had to for time. So there was a lot there was a lot more detail about <laughs> what bits of the animals go where. Right. Like some of it specific parts of the animal are given to the priest who performs the ceremony as kind of like a thank you and stuff. And it's it's yeah, for any vegans out there, I apologize. <laughs> but as as also as someone who has tried to get out of the underworld a lot, mm -hmm. did her observations feel familiar? Like what stood out to you? Yeah, oh, a bunch of stuff. To start with, uh, something that, that is quite different to Hades the video game is that I was surprised by her description of, of Hades as a location. So she she described it as sort of um, dull, like uh, generally dull and grey and dark and boring. And my interpretation, like in Hades the video game, it is luxurious and bright and full of colour. And I guess I also had picked up some of what she talked about with like Christian preconceptions of it being like a, a fiery place. And yeah, I had no idea that Hades was a bit dull and grey. <laughs> Did you? No, I, I didn't. I always thought, I thought the fire was green, but it still burned. And I think I based that off Disney's Hercules. <laughs> right, okay. Oh god, is it? Yeah. And uh, yeah, apparently that's not that's not the case. Um, she did say that, like, similar to in the game, that, you know, there are the different areas, like the Elysium Fields, 
the VIP section, she described it. Uh, that That's a little bit more like interesting, a bit more of a classy place to hang out if you're in the underworld. And which is similar in the game itself. It's where you run into characters like Theseus and Asterius, uh, who are, are sort of trapped there, but also quite like, well, at least Theseus, he's quite enjoying the whole process. He, he quite likes hanging out in the Elysium, I think. Let's talk about Theseus, mm-hmm. all right? Because you did a video that was all about the dialogue system of Hades, which we might talk about in a bit. Right. But in that video, you had a bit of a dig at Theseus, <laughs> who's the the ancient Greek hero who th- fought the Minotaur and stuff like that. Yeah. But Gun- Gunnar was telling me that Theseus has a whole fan club. Right, yeah. You know, so what, the... What's your problem, dude? Yeah, this, like, so the big hero cult in Athens for, for your boy Theseus, apparently. So again, my interpretation here is coming from, from the way that Supergiants has... Uh, portrayed him but i have a number of reasons why i don't like him uh first of all he is extremely smug so i, I guess a very mild spoiler the game has been out for a little while now but it's Theseus is someone that you fight in the game along with his his sort of partner asterius which is the minotaur which he defeated in his previous life and so when and whenever you meet theseus and asterius theseus is just horrible to you he's got this big gross smile he sort of leers at you he always interrupts Asterius, who is actually the more interesting one of the pair, quite frankly. He, so he saved the Minotaur in, in the world of Supergiant uh, and, and sort of brought him with him to the VIP club of Elysium. And I tell you what, he, he, he knows that he did that. He lords it up over that Minotaur, and I don't think that's deserved. The man's about 95% muscle, and he also knows that, quite frankly. And it's the smugness. It's the smugness surrounding the whole <laughs> thing. I just, I'm not a fan of Theseus, and I enjoy trying to hit him with a sword on a regular basis. So uh, if it's not Theseus, then who is your favorite ancient Greek deity? I think I like Poseidon a lot. He is one of the the three brothers, uh, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades. And they all have a similar kind of ego issue. Uh, They're all like extremely powerful. And I think it's gone to their head a little bit. But Poseidon is sort of your like, he tries to be your cool uncle. Like he, he's like the one that would probably like offer you a cigarette outside a birthday party that he knows you're not meant to have one. You're going to keep it quiet, but like, it's quite cool that you've got this bond. Poseidon is that for Zagreus. Um, and it, it's sometimes a little lame and awkward, but I, I, I'm quite fond of it. Gunnar was telling us about the, the gifts or the sacrifices that people used to give to the gods. And you, as Zagreus, mm-hmm. you give gifts to the gods in the game as well. But it's not like the tail section of an animal. Unfortunately. It's nectar or whatever. But what does that do? How does that change the game? Initially, you do it and you will receive an item that will give some additional power to your, your character. Your, your first experience with Hades is like, oh, okay, if I have a better relationship with some of these characters, they'll make me more powerful, that's, that's useful. However, once you've played it for, for as long as I have, really the, the nectar and the ambrosia is actually a currency that you use to sort of romance the, the various uh, like Olympian gods or Greek heroes that, that you fancy the most. That's, like, if I'm, I'm, I'm going to be completely honest with you, that's what it really becomes about uh, like in the late game. So it is like giving gifts to people in uh, Stardew Valley. Exactly. And, or Mass Effect. I don't know why, like, video games often sort of boils down the process of, of romance to, like, uh, fetching the right, the right item for someone. But yeah, yeah, essentially, it's like that. It's like Stardew Valley. You say this, I don't think you're the only person uh, <laughs> who's, who's getting into romancing characters. The people, if you look on the internet, mm-hmm. people are getting incredibly deeply uh, horny for these characters let's just say it uh, what's going on what is it about these gods that makes them so attractive to people is it just the illustrations of the artwork or or is something else going on Th- that is absolutely true it is it the internet is rampant with this and if you haven't played hades you might be thinking oh well like every every video game every fandom has this people often get very infatuated with fictional characters however in this case first of all like supergiant has not shied away from the fact that these gods that you're encountering and even like the, the more the, the lesser characters like the heroes as well that they're, they're all incredibly attractive which is from what i hear from from Gunnar, like that is very in keeping with uh, ancient history like the, the illustrations themselves like none of these characters aren't hot it's no mistake that people have come to this conclusion and also there's just i feel like there's a, there's an olympian god or an underworld god for 
for everyone's taste, you know? Like, if you want to get spoken down to by an angry woman with a whip, like, there's someone here for you. And please, please read nothing into the fact that that's the one that I referenced first. It could, it, I could have picked any example. <laughs> there is a... Uh... There's like a lot of story to the game as well, so a surprising amount for mm -hmm. a rogue like like you were saying. For that genre, it's usually quite rare for you to have so much dialogue. They're usually quite light on it and light on character building and stuff. Yeah. But in Hades, there's a ton of it. But how is that delivered to you? Is it like drip fed to you? So so if you think about it, um, just the way that a roguelike works that like we described earlier, it's a really big challenge in terms of like how do you express a narrative to players who could be progressing through this game at very different speeds like some some people that play Hades complete their first run like defeat the final boss of Hades uh, on their you know fifth or sixth attempt if they're really really good at the game um, whereas some it could take 100 attempts to reach that point and Supergiant are all about narratives that keep talking about what the player has been doing when this the a player's progress can be so different. It just seems like an impossible challenge to, to get something that can work for everyone. And they managed to do it, which no one has really done in this genre before. And it, it comes down to a bunch of things. Um, one of the more surprising facts about Hades, for example, is that its script is more than 300,000 words long, which is just over the length of the first book in A Song of Ice and Fire. Like, A Game of Thrones is like less than 300,000 words. This script is, is longer than that, which is pretty mind-blowing. That's longer than Homer's Odyssey. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, right? That, that solves some of the problems because they, they don't want to hit the point where they're just repeating the same lines that you've heard over and over again. And they, they really do manage to avoid that. So, so part of the way they solve that is by just having a huge script that they can keep dipping into. A lot of the, the story is told through dialogue with characters. And they have a really clever system that's running behind the scenes whenever you talk to a character where they, they sort of check a bunch of criteria based on like, uh, you know, what, what happened in your last run? Like, what's the furthest you've got in Hades? Like, what weapon have you been using recently? Uh, what enemy killed you in the last encounter? Have you spoken to this person before? Have you spoken to other characters recently? There's all these different criteria that come into place and the game tries to pick the best dialogue option from this huge script that we just mentioned so that every time you speak to a character, it feels relevant to what you're doing right now and also it isn't repeating itself, which, you know, a lot of games that you play over and over again for the, the amount of time that people are playing Hades, they have to rely on repetition at some point and Hades manages to put that off way longer than you'd expect. Some people have been playing this game for 100 hours and have yet to hear a line repeated yet, which is insane when they're all fully voiced um, and written really, really well. Like, there's a reason people... I joked about why people are so horny about these characters, and part of it is the illustration and the, the tone of each character. But also, they're really interesting. Like, it's not difficult to get invested in their storylines. I really enjoy how it was like Gunnar said, everybody's here. Everybody from Greek mythology, mm -hmm. you know, is at this, is in this game. Yeah. <laughs> or seems to be. Yeah, it's a very interesting interpretation of, of some of the Greek myths. And it really, actually, one of the things that I love about it the most is that it really nails the fact that these are stories uh, and legends about unbelievably powerful beings, right? They're, they control the oceans and the skies and everything in between. And yet a lot of their feuds and a lot of their real motivations come down to just really relatable family dynamics. There's three brothers that are competing uh, with one another and it's all about bravado and power and who's the most important. And they can be really petty with one another and yet they're, they're Olympian gods. They're like the most powerful beings in the world. They, they defeated a titan together and yet they also you know, don't like if you spend too much time with one of them and, and, and pay them less attention. I, I, I feel like that, that is something that's really present in Greek myth itself and, and Hades, the video game, uh, really understands that and, and embraces it. I was playing last night and uh, Hades told me off uh, because the dog Cerberus tore up the lounge. Because <laughs> exactly, yeah. He said, because you disappeared, son. The yeah. dog was so upset, he tore up the lounge. It's like <laughs> the image of this three-headed giant dog just wrecking the pillows. But instead of wrecking the pillows, he's, he's actually just demolishing all the furniture in the house. Cerberus is wonderful in this game. Everyone, almost, in fact, all the major characters just love this dog. And uh, Hades in particular has a real vibe of, you know, uh, there's like that stereotype of like, 
a dad in a family who doesn't want to get a pet. They just, they refuse to get it. They, they're belligerent about it. They stand their ground until eventually they give in and they get a dog. And then the dad and the dog are the best friends. Like they just like, <laughs> they spend all the time together. And it turns out the dad just needed the permission to love something. <laughs> All right, well, uh, that's it. We're going to have to disappear now. Uh, you've been listening to Hey Lesson with me, Brendan Caldwell, and my guest co-host this week, Chris Spratt. Thank you very much for helping us out. Oh, it's uh, absolutely my pleasure. This is a, it's a fun video game slash world slash ideological belief to, to talk about. Uh, where can people find uh, your stuff that people people make games as things? Uh, the easiest place to, to find us is always on YouTube. Um, yeah, just search People Make Games on YouTube and Hades, if you're listening to this podcast fairly close to when it came out, uh, is probably the last thing that went up on the channel. We, we don't have a huge budget at People Make Games, but we did try and create a set for that video, which involved nailing a velvet duvet cover to our living room wall. And if you want to see how bad slash good that looked, then that's the place to do it. If you have enjoyed uh, this episode of Hey Lesson, or if you've just been blasting through all of our episodes and not even noticing that we don't have any adverts, because that's how good it feels to not ever listen to an advert, um, maybe consider throwing us a tip on Patreon. Uh, if you do, you will get extra goodies, uh, including the full interviews with uh, our archaeologists, our scientists, our cave divers, our parasite biologists, everyone that we talk to. Uh, but you'll also get maybe behind the scenes video updates uh, and a bonus podcast every month depending on what tier that you subscribe to uh, go to patreon.com slash hey lesson or follow the links in the show notes uh, and you'll see how to get that if you can't spare the change there are other ways to show your gratitude and that is to just share any episodes that you've liked with friends and family and workmates whoever uh, even just throw a link up on facebook saying hey i listened to a fun thing about a three-headed dog this week <laughs> you know here here it is maybe you'll like it too and that that always helps us out but until next time thank you again for listening and thanks again to to brat for all the the godly knowledge <laughs> no problem uh bye everyone hey lesson will return <laughs> wow that's a dramatic final line i enjoyed that i'm in, inspired by the the mass effect trailer that was revealed oh no wait that was Mass Effect will continue. Hey, lesson will continue. <laughs> Goodbye.